What does this woman's face and this ancient tomb have in common? And how is this shell related to the length of your arm? If you're interested, stay tuned, because today we're going to be looking at The Geometry of Art and Life by Matila Ghica. Prince Matila Ghica was a Romanian academic born in Moldavia in 1881. He acquired the title Prince through his relation to Grigore Alexandru Ghica, his great-grandfather, who was the last reigning prince of Moldavia before the Crimean War. During his life, he served in the French Navy as well as the Romanian Navy, and he was a novelist, poet, historian, and diplomat. But today, he is probably best remembered for his influential works on aesthetics, geometry, philosophy, and design. For example, the famous surrealist painter Salvador Dali, known for his melting clocks and cool elephants on stilts, uh, was heavily influenced by Matila Gika's writings on aesthetic proportions, aspects of which served as a basis or inspiration for some of his paintings, including this one, titled Leda Atomica. Today we're going to look at one of Matila Gika's most talked about books, The Geometry of Art and Life. Here you can see two different copies, an older hardcover version and a newer softcover version. In this video, we're just going to look at the older one. Just looking at the exterior, uh, we can see it's pretty simple looking. No designs on the front or back, just a solid red cloth cover with the title on the spine along with the author's name and the publishing house. I'm guessing this originally sold with a more decorative dust jacket, but I'm not sure as I haven't been able to find any images online of the first edition other than this image from Green Ink Booksellers on Abe Books, and I don't know if that's the original dust jacket in this photo, um, or if it's one that somebody just made to cover the book. Anyway, let's open it up and take a look inside. Okay, so we've got a brief title, and then the full title page. The Geometry of Art and Life by Matila Gika published in New York by Sheed and Ward in 1946. And opposite the title page, we can see a list of some of his other works on aesthetics and numbers, which were published in French in Paris. On the next page, we have a dedication to Roderick O'Connor. At first, I thought this might have been in reference to the Irish painter Roderick O'Connor, who would have lived in Paris at the same time as Gika, but then I realized a more obvious connection. Um, and I'm guessing this is in reference to Sir Nicholas Roderick O'Connor, who was Gika's father-in-law, who had died back in 1908. It does seem kind of strange, though, that he would leave off Nicholas's first name, um, as well as the title Sir. So there's a chance, too, that this could be a reference to Matila Gika's son, who was also named Roderick after his father-in-law but I haven't been able to find any information online about his son's middle name. Um, so I don't know if this is in reference to the son or the father-in-law. Uh, but anyway, Nicholas Roderick O'Connor was a British ambassador to Turkey and was related to Gika through his daughter Eileen O'Connor, who married Gika. Here are some pictures of Gika with his wife Eileen, and here's a picture of Nicholas O'Connor's obituary in the March 20, 1908 edition of the New York Times. Also, I'm not sure what this little honorific stands for, the R-E after his name. Uh, if any of you have any ideas, uh, please let me know in the comments. Okay, so the book then starts with an introduction, which explains the purpose of the book. Here are a few interesting excerpts. The introduction begins with this quote from Plato's Timaeus. And it was then that all these kinds of things thus established receive their shapes from the ordering one, through the action of ideas and numbers. Gika then writes, It is not generally suspected how much the above pronouncement of Plato, or, in a more general way, his conception of aesthetics, has influenced European, or let us say, Western, thought and art, especially architecture. In the same way that Plato conceived the great ordering one, or the one ordering with art, as arranging the cosmos harmoniously according to the pre-existing eternal paradigm archetypes or ideas. So the Platonic, or rather Neoplatonic view 
of art conceive the artist as planning his work of art according to a pre-existing system of proportions, as a symphonic composition ruled by a dynamic symmetry corresponding in space to musical eurythmy in time. This technique of correlated proportions was in fact transposed from the Pythagorean conception of musical harmony. The intervals between notes being measured by the lengths of the strings of the lyra, not by the frequencies of the tones, but the result is the same, as length and numbers of vibrations are inversely proportional, so that the chords produce comparisons or combinations of ratios, that is, systems of proportions. In the same way, Plato's aesthetics, his conception of beauty, evolved out of harmony and rhythm, the role of numbers therein, and the final correlation between beauty and love were also bodily taken from the Pythagorean doctrine, and then developed by Plato and his school. And later in the introduction he writes, The Pythagorean creed that everything is arranged according to number, taken up by Plato, is justified not only in art, it was a Gothic master builder who in 1398 said, Arsine nihil, but also in the realm of nature. The use of geometry in the study and classification of crystals is obvious, but it is only lately that its role in the study of life and living growth has begun to be recognized. He then finishes the introduction by writing this. Curiously enough, the patterns, themes of symmetry, spirals, discovered in living forms and living growth, show those same themes of proportion which in art seem to have been used by Greek and Gothic architects, and paramount amongst them the ratio or proportion called by Leonardo's friend Luca Pacioli, the divine proportion, by Kepler, one of the two jewels of geometry, and commonly known as the golden section, appears to be the principal invariant, to use an expression popular in modern mathematical physics, as remarkable by its algebraical and geometrical properties as by this role in biology and in aesthetics. There are then such things as the mathematics of life and the mathematics of art, and the two coincide. The present work tries to present in a condensed form what we may call a geometry of art and life. After the introduction, we have the table of contents showing the different chapters. We've got proportion in space and time, the golden section, geometrical shapes on the plane, geometrical shapes in space, the regular partitions on the plane and in space, the geometry of life, the transmission of geometrical symbols and plans, Greek and Gothic canons of proportions, and symphonic composition. Then we have a list of plates, and we can see all the different illustrations in this book. It looks like there are 80 total. All right, so let's explore some of the different ideas in the book. First up, let's look at the golden section. Gika calls the golden section the simplest asymmetrical section. In chapter one, he writes the following. The golden section. The Greeks had already noticed that three terms at least are necessary in order to express a proportion. Such is the case of the continuous proportion A over B equals B over C but we can try to obtain a greater simplification by reducing to two the number of the terms and making C equal to A plus B, so that if, for example, A and B are the two segments of a straight line of length C, the continuous proportion becomes A over B equals B over A plus B. He then goes on to explain that this ratio is equal to 1 plus the square root of 5 over 2, roughly 1.618. This is the golden section, or as Luca Pacioli put it, the divine proportion. The symbol most often used for it is the Greek letter phi. In chapter 2, Giga gives the famous Fibonacci number sequence. 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, etc. Where each number in the sequence, besides the first two, is the sum of the two previous numbers in the sequence. He explains that if you calculate the ratio between each number in the sequence and the number that came before it, the result very quickly begins to approximate the golden section. He then writes, We can therefore say that this 2B additive series, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, 21, etc., called the series of Fibonacci, from the nickname Filius Bonacci of Leonardo of Pisa, who dis rediscovered it in 1202, tends asymptotically towards the phi progression, with which it identifies itself very quickly, 
and it has also the remarkable property of producing gnomonic growth, in which the growing surface or volume remains homothetic, similar to itself, by a simple process of accretion of discrete elements, of integer multiples of the unit of accretion, hence the capital role in botany of the Fibonacci series. He then goes on to explain how this series shows up in different biological forms, such as plants and marine life. He mentions how the angles of leaves around the stems of plants often follow the Fibonacci series. He also explains that these types of growth, based on the golden section, always have a logarithmic spiral as their directing curve. For example, we can see that spiral demonstrated by this shell, and we can see how it relates to the golden section by overlaying this diagram. In this case, the ratio of the line segment AB to the line segment BC is the square root of phi, the golden section. Gika also talks about how the golden section relates to the proportions of the human body. For example, he explains that on average, the ratio between a person's height and the height of their navel approximates phi, which means that the ratio between the height of a person's navel and the distance between their navel and the top of their head also approximates phi. He also writes, the vertical distance between the top of the head and the navel, the minor of the two segments in the phi proportion determined, determined by the navel, is equal to the distance between the tip of the medium finger, the arm hanging vertically, and the floor or horizontal level supporting the hole. Just for fun, I tested this on myself and found that the ratio of my total height, 5 feet 11 inches, to the height of my navel, 4 feet 5 inches, is about 1.7317, which is roughly 0.1137 greater than phi, and the distance between my navel and the top of my head is 1 foot 6 inches, while the distance between the tip of my middle finger of my arm at rest and the floor was about 7 inches more than that, uh, so 2 feet and 1 inch. Matila Gika also explains how the proportions of the face are related to the golden section, and he uses the face of the Olympic tennis champion Helen Wills as an example. Here's a picture of that. We can see the harmonic analysis here, showing how the various proportions of her face are related to the golden section. And note the large isosceles triangle in the middle here. This triangle is related to the pentagram in this way, and the pentagram and pentagon are deeply related to the golden section. For example, in this diagram, you can see that AB to BC is phi, the ratio EC to ED is phi, and the ratio BD to ED is phi. Later in the book, Gika shows how this ancient tomb, the rock tomb at Mira, follows a similar proportional scheme, which reveals that same isosceles triangle. And then he goes on to show how a number of other ancient and medieval structures incorporated these in similar proportions. All right, so that was a look into the geometry of art and life by Matila Gika. If you enjoyed the video, please leave a like or a comment and consider subscribing. If you want to see more stuff like this, just let me know. And uh, if you want to get some old books of your own, feel free to check out the link to my online store in the description. And thank you so much for watching. All right, stay tuned for more videos and goodbye.